Um, this is going to be a little bit of a, a self-indulgent talk, and I hope that you forgive me for that. But it's going to talk a little bit about my journey into understanding design and then kind of the end product of that, that thinking process. And I hope you get something out of it. And as I said again, I really appreciate the fact that you've spent the time or given the time to come here tonight. So there's going to be some pretty pictures at the end, but at the start there's going to be some not so pretty pictures and I hope you'll run with me on that one. Um, how much time do you think we've got? I'm going to keep my eyes on you. When you start falling asleep, we will definitely stop and you'll, yeah, you'll give me a thing. About an hour. And that's, um, that's way too long. That's way too long. So we'll try and cut it shorter than that. There's plenty of food still left, so let's keep going. Um, look, the one thing you have to know about me, every one of us, every one of us, I'll talk to a few of us tonight, has a personal history. We're all a byproduct of our, our past. And I think that's a beautiful thing and how it presents itself later on in our life and what we do with our life. The thing you need, should, need to know about me, I came from a very working class family, uh, family of five kids, dad worked in a factory, mum, good hard, you know, housewife. So you can imagine design did not have the biggest influence in our life. That really never even entered into the discussion around the dinner table. It was either whether it was meat or whether it was not meat that night. Um, so I always remember this one time that uh, dad came as we're sitting around the dinner table saying, we got some fantastic news and the news was that we managed to negotiate buying our own house. And so by buying our own house, we had the opportunity to make it our own. And in making it our own, we could choose the colours that we were going to paint the rooms of our house. And so we all got together and I, there was a certain buzz, I always remember this, this excitement that we could make this our own and we could paint the rooms of a house. I could paint my room, I could do whatever I wanted to. So this is what we came up with. And this is actually the dining room in all its glory, the roof, the walls, everyone was different because we were going to be designers. We were going to create our own environment. We had to express ourselves. The yellow was me, by the way. And then we were quite excited by this. We were, wow, this is, it was, if I look back on it, it's a kaleidoscope you know, some drug theme would have uh, imagined. But at the time, we did not see that. We just thought this is an opportunity to express ourselves. And that's something that we do as designers, we express ourselves. Not too long after that, surprisingly, and I don't know how it happened, my father, um, through tennis, I think, met an architect. And he came home and he told us he'd met this architect, and I had this image, architect. Whoa, these people are like these incredible design things that do these amazing things. And he invited, the architect invited us to come over for afternoon tea, which was very sophisticated in Australia at the time. And we went over there and I was really looking forward to see what the architect would do with his house because he was a designer. And so with great expectancy, I walked over there, entered the house, walked in, and I saw this. And I was like, what's going on here? And I always remember on the trip back in the car, going to Dad saying, I thought you said he was a designer. And my dad was embarrassed and he said, yeah, maybe he's a shit designer. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, he's a shit designer. <laughs> I'm actually really good. <laughs> I understand how to do colour and I've got, I've got abilities, you know. So it started at thinking. The, the next time that I actually came across design in my life was um, this. I, my mum, God bless her, um, she got me an apprenticeship. I wasn't the best student, let's say, at school and she got me an apprenticeship working in a nursery. And uh, as part of the apprenticeship and working in that nursery, what you had to do is you had to go to TAFE and you had to do horticulture. And when I was at, at horticulture, studying away, I opened up a book here and I found Japanese gardens. Now, I cannot tell you, a lot of you haven't been to Australia. I came from Auburn. I saw telegraph poles, I saw concrete, and I saw industry. 
to see this was like another world to me. It opened up a kind of like, what is going on here? What is this? This is beautiful. I understand it. I don't understand it. I just think it's beautiful. Then later on, as I'm going through this very same book, I come across this. And I look at this and I think, and it's called a Rionji and it's a garden. And I think, this is a garden? I can't see any plants. I can't see any trees. I can't see anything. Somebody's taken the mickey out here. You know, somebody's got to call these guys bluff. This is not a garden. This is a load of crap. You know, what are they doing here? And I just remember looking at this going, this is ridiculous. How can anybody call this a garden and put it in a book? The funny thing is, the course ran for three years, but at the end of the third year, I happened to open up this very same book again, turned to this page, opened it up, I saw it. It communicated to me in no other way that I can explain to you. The space, the idea of imagination of taking you to another place, the beauty, the simplicity. I don't know what had happened in that period between me starting and seeing it as crap and then seeing it as this, but some transition had happened. And it happens in all of us, in our process of understanding. And part of the thing I love about design is it's not like science. I can't teach you one and one equals two and therefore it needs to be like this. How do you find this point in design? And so I had to go to Japan. And I came back after completing my apprenticeship and said to my mother, I'm heading to Japan. Nobody in our family had been past Gosford which is about 120 kilometers away. So this was quite a big adventure. So I had to head off, and so I did. And when I got to Japan, I got to the beauty of what Japan actually holds in so many ways. And I started to understand that design is more than just about the physical form. It has an intellectual component to it. And I realized that that garden that I looked at was actually part of Zen. And Zen is more than just the physicality. Man. It's, a philo it's a philosophical, it's a questioning thing about what is life, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Anybody got an idea on that? I bet you don't. You know? Give me 20 years and maybe I can answer. And it was tied to that garden, the idea that that was actually a Zen garden. And I was fascinated by the idea that a monk had sat there for 20 years meditating on that idea on that garden to understand the meaning of it and he ultimately when he stood up after that year of oh, 20 years of meditation couldn't walk anymore and it then created a, a cultural icon in Japan called Daruma-san and the beauty of Daruma-san is that you see they've got the white eyes there that means that uh, you give that to a person uh, when they at the start of a new year with the idea you should have an ambition about how you can improve yourself how you can learn more and when you, you, you decide what that is, you paint in that one eye. And Daruma's son has got a heavy base because he can't walk. And whenever you struggle with life, you knock Daruma's son over. But he always bounces back up because he knows. And ultimately, whenever you're challenged, you hit Daruma's son and he comes back up. And you ultimately should find the answer. And so you paint in the other eye at the end of the, other eye at the, end of the day. So I, I was fascinated by this idea that design and, 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 and gardens and space could be far more than just the physicality of it. And then I came across something what I find really interesting in Tara Ando, which I think is one of the great architects. But also I think Tara Ando is one of the greatest landscape architects. And this is how design can evolve and change. And every one of us as designers is building on the back of design that has preceded us. We are original thinkers only in that we can see past the point of the last person or see ideas embedded in what has preceded us. And Undo has actually taken Riaunjin and taken it to a new level. This is one of the, the most beautiful pieces of his work as a landscape architect, as a gardener that I think. And this is called the Half and Half House in my book. And it's the beauty of the client coming in and saying, I want a house and I want a garden. 
Anando, in his wisdom, said, built this most beautiful piece. And the story goes that when, an, when the client came and it was completed and he said, I love the house, where's the garden? He said, well, there's your garden. And the guy goes, but there's nothing in the garden. And he goes, okay, sit there at the window for a day and I'll come back and I'll talk to you. So he sat there for the day and he said, okay, so how do you like your garden? He said, well, not much. He said, okay, so where was that shadow in the morning? Over there. Now where is the shadow in the afternoon? It's over here. That butterfly that we see flying across there, was it always there? That leaf that is now on the ground, was it always there? No, it wasn't. Ah, what a beautiful garden. <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful thing that we work with. And I love the intellectualization of it. I also like the spirituality of it. I also like the way that we can take it to different places if we take it on that journey. And I got a lot out of that, that experience. Uh, I, I then decided, you know, I had enough of that. And I just traveled all over the world for probably about seven years. Surfed, I was a great surfer. I traveled up and down, went everywhere and got married. <laughs> They say that the, the death of a great writer is a pram in the hallway. Um, in this case, it was the opposite. The marriage actually made me focus that I now, that I now needed to focus on something. And I needed to take on something that really could pull the things that I, you know, in my head were operating and try and pull it all together. So I, uh, this is an actual, one of the scary photos. That's me <laughs> somewhere there, there. Um, with my ultimate business partner sitting up over there when we first started uni. So as a mature age student, I went back and started studying and I decided I'd study landscape architecture. How I came to that is a mystery, but it was all those little bits and pieces that had preceded it. And I love design because I love the idea that it's a little bit like Schrodinger's thought experiment. What is inside the box? We know that when we start a design, when we are given a blank sheet of paper, when we are given the base to draw with, that there is an answer. But we don't know what that answer is. We have to go inside ourselves and find that answer. But we have no mechanism for finding that answer other than processes that we have interrogated and worked with ourselves. It's, again, not like the engineer can go and say, I need to get this arching bridge, therefore it has to be blah, blah, blah. We have to find it ourselves, and each of us will come with a unique design. And every one of you, if I gave you the challenge of a design, it would be totally, everyone would be uniquely different, but beautiful in its own way because it's you. And I like that idea. And then I started thinking, and it kind of goes back to that first bit about all that colour that I started thinking about about design when I was first starting out as a young boy. And I thought, I love this idea that um, Richard Meyer, Richard kind of went, yeah, I don't care about colour. I'm just going to do white, but I'm going to do beautiful white structures, beautiful white buildings. So he's taken a few issues out of the equation, but he's going to craft you something beautiful, but you're going to get it in white. Het song de Brown. You don't know what you're going to get with them. You might get rock, you might get beautifully crafted steel flipped up on the edges to articulate a transmission building. But they are playing with materials and they're challenging themselves in different ways. But it's another approach in the design process. The thing I like about Undo in a lot of ways is he is really a truly a great architect. But Undo doesn't ever change his handrail detail. Every detail on Undo's buildings, that's his handrail. And you think about it, you know, oh, I've got this design. Oh, I've got to come up with this incredible, you know, detail. And, and what, no, doesn't give a shit about that. I'm just going to do what I do, but I'm going to get the form and the space and the light. That's where I'm going to operate in. I don't know if you know this guy, but this is called Glenn Merkett. 
Has anybody, do you guys know Glenn Merkitt? Yeah, I think just one of the most beautiful architects. He had an idea about touching the ground lightly. And I, I really, really like that, that kind of idea that in the Australian landscape that you, you kind of set it very carefully and in the, in the, um, in the landscape in such a way that it, it works with it. But I went to a lecture from uh, somebody who talked about Glenn Merkitt and I got one thing out of it. And it said that what Glenn does is that he hones an idea, that he gets an idea. He works with a composite of ideas, but he's honing it. And every time he's making that sharper, better, he's not jumping all over the place. He's honing his craft. And in a lot of ways, that's what we should be do I think, should be doing, honing our craft understanding who we are, what we do, what our principles and values are, and then honing it, every time making it better. Last thing before I get on to some of the work is when I was studying at university there was a, a thing, it was actually a little bit like this at the uni, and there was beams at the very top and some guy in some drunken state perhaps had crawled up with a crayon and written, man is part of nature. And it was there for four years, and all the time I had been so, yeah, so what? And then I started thinking about it in the very end. Man is part of nature. What does that mean? That means that everything we do, therefore, is natural. If we are part of nature, everything that we do is, is natural. So I love the fact that we can look at a beaver dam in industry. You know, a beaver can get in and change the course of a river, make it, you know, flow in a different way, build an engineering structure, and we look at it, and we'll do a Richard, a David Attenborough, you know, talk on it and go, wow, how beautiful, how incredible. We can also look at a termite's nest, high-rise building, perfectly constructed, better than anything we could ever do, cross-ventilated, everything, temperature control, all the rest of it. We admire it, think it's beautiful, it's natural. But when we come to... This that man builds, we reel back and say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, not nature, not part of nature. And I think in doing that, we distance ourselves from the harsh reality that we are part of nature. And everything that we do, you not, might not like that. You might think that's not beautiful. But it is natural because we built it. The problem is, is we've lost that understanding, I think, that we are part and that we need to work with it. And so the systems, we have to re-understand those systems that we work with and embed that in our thinking. So after I finished university, I went and actually I came here and I worked in London. I worked with Klaus and I worked with, I know there's a few other firms that probably Gillespie's but not here anymore. Um, and I think I, all I did was road planting, and visual impact assessments, so there wasn't a lot happening at the time. And I got a call to go over and, and work in Hong Kong on the airport, on just everything that was happening over there. I say there's nothing to see here because I worked there for seven years and I worked there, but I did design after design after design. They ripped it off the drawing board, they built it. And I got to learn and learn and learn. And I learned because I made a lot of mistakes. They say that great buildings leak, and the reason they say great buildings leak is because people are trying things, but ultimately water will find you out because it's got all the time in the world to find your faults. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't challenge ourselves. But in the failure, I learned, and there's a wonderful saying, it says, er and er and er again, but less and less and less. And so that's kind of been the philosophy of trying and learning and failing. Seven years, I haven't got anything that I could show you that I'd be proud of. But then I went back, tired, totally um, broken, not broken, but just, I was over it, it was all gone. I just needed to re-energize my battery. So I actually, excuse me, I'll just get some water. I actually went back to um, Australia um, and I started the lawn mowing business. This is not actually me. <laughs> I had better clothes than that. But I was really good. I used to get in that old line and then, yeah, anyway. 
two years of mowing lawns, just clearing my head, just thinking about things. And I got a call from my partner who you saw before saying, I'd like to give you a go. Would you like to have a try to a competition? And the eye, the energy started flowing again. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Let's have a go at a competition. So we had a, a go at a competition. So here we are, the young, not so young me, but the rest of them are kind of enthusiastic. You remember that? You know, when you're at uni, when you're challenging, when you're pushing, when you're, you want to try and make a change, you want to make things better. That's what we're about, right? That's what we want to do. And we're going to keep that fight right the way through. So this was actually for a project that we ultimately won. And I must have gone in probably 10 design competitions internationally across the world to try and win one. But we actually did win this one. And it was for Parramatta, which was very close to my heart because I live very near to there. And um, it was embedded in the thinking that drove the whole practice and the drawings and the work that I'm going to show you later on. And it comes from that idea about nature. It comes from the idea that design is just not about pretty. That we are part of a system. That we cannot think about a design unless we think about the embedded systems that are part of all this. The ecology, the economy, the water, the energy, the people. All these things have to come together. And if they all come together in the right way, we can truly produce great outcomes. And so we produced a design, sorry, I'm actually jumping. So we decided we'd set up in Manly, and I talked to a few guys before about the fact that um, all the guys go surfing at, at lunchtime and, and all the rest. It's a great environment to be in, but it's also refreshing in the head. We've now got um, a staff of, I don't know, nearly 50 people around the world. We've got three offices or four offices now, Melbourne, Sydney, and, and Mike here is actually setting up, trying to set up the office in, in Bristol. It's hard yards. But that starting point, that genesis has led us, that underpinning has led us to the ability to go around and grow and to generate this business that we have now. We started out really just young blokes sitting around scratching their ass trying to achieve something. And this first design competition that actually set us on our way, we beat some of the biggest architectural practices from around the world because we took on a very, very complex project and distilled it down to the most simplest of ideas. That this road that needed to be transformed had to be considered in a manner that you took all the forces that were coming at you to take them and to turn them into positives. I have a saying that if you want to cross the river, you have to jump in the river. So you have to understand the forces at work and see how you can turn them to your own advantage. Aikido, Judo, all those things, that's what they do. Understand, don't reject the site constraints. Don't reject the issues that are... Opportunity comes from those constraints. How do you drive those and make those the positives? And so this is the road that was 23 kilometres, the main artery of Sydney, totally clogged, didn't work anymore, was failing, all the buildings, all the land was dying along its edge. And so our scheme really looked at how we could revitalise that. And so it looked at all the systems, transport, ecology, water, communities, connections, and how that could all come together. The reality was that the, the, um, the competition, and they told us this later on, was really about how they could widen the streets and put some trees in, which is quite often the case. But our role is past that. Our role is to sit and say, OK, but what are the real issues here? Let's understand this and challenge ourselves. <coughs> and how can we make this something truly significant? And this was the <coughs> ultimate um, objective, that community is connecting to this lifeblood of a, of a road system. So once you get something like that, all of a sudden you've got a base that you can start moving from. And from that base, we started growing our business. We, we then started going back to actually working with developers and just doing small scale developments. We'd won a large scale design for an overall residential um, development in a, a Rustville area of Sydney. But then we came back in and started working with very simple little courtyard designs. And the thing I'm trying to say about this is that we, you can work, you have to be able to work 
from the very large scale down to the Phillips head sunk screw that's got a male and a female that sits just beautifully in that composition. That's where we operate. We operate right across that, that breadth. We control that whole composition right the way down to the detail. So this might look like a pretty ordinary kind of like maybe you can see a little bit of that Japanese influence coming in here. But all that water that you see is coming off the roofs and being cleaned. All the plant material you can see is um, renewal, um, fruits, herbs, and uh, traditional plants for herbal medicines and things like that. So we're trying to suggest the idea of how can all this come together. This is actually sitting on the top of a car park as well. So we explored ideas when we're working in the, in, um, in the courtyard spaces as well. And just some of the, the images, all of these are part of that whole composition and the work that we did. We then got a, a very unique opportunity to work on a, an old all, uh, all uh, storage facility in BP, which you can see over there. You can see the Opera House, the Harbour Bridge down there. And it was a very unique um, experience for us because um, I hadn't done a lot of proposals since I joined the office with Adrian. And Adrian said to me, Phil, you've got to also go out and win work. I'd just been drawing. I don't know about that, mate. Don't want to do that. But I had to do it. <laughs> so I went out checked it out and I put this submission together. Now hopefully this will help you all feel a lot better about yourself. We won the, comp we won the submission, but when they called us up they said you won because you were $40,000 less than anybody else. You are the cheapest by far. We couldn't resist getting you guys on board. <laughs> so it was a bit of a sweet moment. We're going, Y oh, shit. <laughs> and I went in and I said, hey, Adrian, guess what? We won that thing. And he goes, oh, wow, really? That's great. Oh, by the way. Anyway. <laughs> but this was a great opportunity for us. And, and it was a great opportunity to explore some of the, the, de the design ideas that we've been, we're working with. Can I say, I don't think design is about having a big budget. I think the day that you base your design on a big budget is the day that it's going to ultimately lead to tears. Design is about intelligent, first thinking, about getting it right, getting the system right, and then understanding how to move through those gears. The thing I'm quite proud about this is that when we first joined the project, they had uh, $7 million to build it. Uh, the government wiped out four million of that project because governments are governments. So they said, oh, we want everything, but we want it for three million dollars. You know, there, straight away, is an opportunity. Okay, now let's challenge ourselves. How do we make this better because it's less money? So what we actually started working with, and you might see it in the next slide, is this is actually just chain link fencing and gal material. Now originally, look where we are, Opera House, Harbour Bridge, this is A grade Sydney, right? This is top line. Their aspiration originally, beautiful stainless steel, highly crafted sandstone, beautifully dimensioned material. But they couldn't afford it. But it actually allowed us to go back to the starting point of this site, which was an industrial site. Old tanks that used to carry oil. So we wanted to talk back to that with the material that we use, which is simple, robust, raw material. And so the fencing when I first arrived on site, for the whole of the site, was chain link fencing with signs saying keep out. So we take that idea and we say, how can we turn that around and make you look at that in a different way and see it as a beautiful part of a composition? And reimagine that, that chain link fencing is not the most pragmatic end for the, you know, the unloved. So that's the idea that we're trying to work with here in simple materials. All the water that came down from here used to just run straight down to the harbour. So then we cleaned and filtered it. And we, we're doing biosystems and we're doing all the stuff that you normally did. 
The sandstone, you can see in these baskets, and you'll see a little bit more of this later on, you know, all the broken sandstone and crap that we found from around the site, putting into the, into the walls to reinstate the walls that were knocked down traditionally because they wanted to get rid of the history. We wanted to reinstate or recognise the history of this site. So that's part of that. And the representation of the rings that you can kind of see. The next year was also a very good year for us. Um, we won another international design competition for a, a major component of uh, uh, Sydney, which was a, a degraded rust belt. It was just a huge rust belt. This was all the industry of Sydney sat. And um, so we came a master plan that, that addressed how that could be revitalised, how it could be developed. And um, it was underpinned. The reason why we won it was because the original site here was built on bog land. And the reason why they built industry on it was because it was pretty crappy land and therefore they didn't want to build residential on it. So the idea was that we wanted to tell that story of water. So we used that water, we cleaned that water. This water now is going to be collected, filtered and used as grey water for the whole development. And there was a very intricate system that we developed and we are working on this still. We've been working on this project since 2003 and still going on, they're gradually building it. It's a little bit like St Pancras and, and um, King's Cross Station, but maybe with a little bit more environmental underpinning, perhaps. Um, just some of the images that were part of the original idea and the composition. And the structure and the systems that underpinned it, very fundamental to it some of the spaces that we're looking at, and then very much that underpin this water and how you capture water. Do you know one thing I find it really weird? Water is one of the most valuable resources that we have. But what traditionally we do, engineers, all of us perhaps do, we capture it, we find a space to put it in a pipe, and we race it out as quickly as possible out into some other water system that then has to somehow or other sort it out and address it. Why? An ephemeral event of a rainfall is something to be truly celebrated. When I was a little kid, when it rained, I got my paddle pop stick and put it in the gutter and watched it go down and tried to understand where it goes and was disappointed when it disappoint, you know, disappeared down the hole. To tell the story of water and how water moves around a site is also very important. It's part of what we try and do in our work and just some of the, the design of um, where it's at at the present moment. So BP I talked about before, which is on that side of the harbour. I used to sit on this headland out here when I was uh, building BP. I used to have my, my sandwich out there. And I looked across at Ballast Point and I used to think, God, I know that's coming up as a project later on because I was going to knock it down. Can you imagine the lucky bastard that got that project? I mean, it was an incredible. It was the last promontory that projected out into Sydney Harbour that hadn't been developed. The last one that had been done was this one here, the Sydney Opera House. So an incredible piece of land sitting in Sydney Harbour. And again, it had been used as a, an oil storage facility, grease manufacturing plant. So the original concept that the, the um, the council was working with that they wanted to reinstate this as a beautiful headland park. They wanted sandstone, they wanted to turn it into the pristine a park that you would normally expect. But we went back to them and we said, our pitch back to them was really about, this park actually represents, and I'll go back on this, this actually represents a change in thinking. You are hundreds thousands of years old as a culture. We are 200 years old as a culture. So when we come out and see this piece of land, we just think, great place to put some oil tanks. But over that 200 year period, we started to realise that we need to respect our landscape. We understand the value of it. So if I went back in and then had to go out and cut sandstone from somewhere out of Sydney, to rebuild this landscape, it was destroying one landscape to rebuild another. So the concept that we built everything on was that we would not destroy anything in the rebuilding of this landscape. To reference that idea of that change in philosophical thinking, to celebrate the fact 
that we now understood the value of a landscape. And so the fundamental principle that drove everything that we did here was that we would recycle. Everything we would look at had to be recycled. If it wasn't recycled, we couldn't consider it. All the walls that we were going to build, everything that we touched, soil, stone, timber, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other elements as I go through. But the, the beauty was when I first went out the site, they had all these old brick buildings. And I thought, what are they going to do with them? They're going to knock them down, they're going to put them in trucks, and they're going to take them off and they're going to chuck them in a tip somewhere. Wouldn't it be great if we could break them down and use this, them to rebuild the site? And so ultimately that's what led to the design philosophy that drove this project. And so, sorry, sorry, just quickly. So this is analysis that we did about the energy that we saved, the biomass, the things that we saved in the process, as opposed to going out and buying new material. And so it's a very valued way of arguing why. Can I tell you, I walked into a presentation with a very high-end government organisation who had fully expected dimension sandstone to be used to build, rebuild this park. And I came in with a bag of broken concrete, rubble, brick, that we'd knocked the end tiles and a couple of taps that had been shoved in to say, this is what I wanted to build the, the whole thing with. And to their credit, they understood the philosophy and they understood that, yes, that was important, that allowed us to build it. It takes a very brave client to be able to do that. And I'll say one thing, you, to a certain extent, are only as good as your client. If your client cannot understand and run with you, then you've got very little chance. And we were very lucky in this project to do that. So this is the end built project. Um, it took us probably about five years to complete. Just a quick little thing. You can see the old concrete walls. All we're doing is cutting, removing, and using all the rubble and rebuilding those walls behind, trying to keep as much as we possibly can. The interesting thing about those, um, that canopy that you're seeing up there, those orange straps, yeah, when we challenged the architects who were Crofty architects who were working with us, nothing had to be new. The idea was, they came back with, I think, was truly beautiful. We found some recycled seatbelt straps that had failed the safety test. So they're actually seatbelt straps that we got recolored. It sounds pretty, I don't know, gooey, but um, a local community group who died who was into weaving and dyeing actually did the dyeing on this. The reason for the orange is actually that uh, there's a local football team that's got, they're called the Tigers, and so the stripes referencing the Tigers. There was also a very famous man out here who flew kites, and so the idea of this being like a kite that floated at the top of there, story in story in story. And when you argue and when you convince and when you talk to a story in a linear line, you can convince people that that is the right approach. And you can see it here a little bit closer. The drums on the right are actually using the old tanks cut up and reused. We got a Nobel laureate po poet who actually lived around the corner who um, actually wrote a piece of poetry for us. Um, and the dots that you can see in this font here are actually um, a reference back to, this was the last tank in Sydney, the biggest last tank that was ever using pop rivets, or not pop rivets, but rivets. And if you know what rivets are, but you, you drill a hole, bang it in, bang the other side. This is the last one that was ever done. So the, the, the fonts that we use all around the park, and you can see in the signage down here, is using that dot as a reference to the fact that this was the last time rivets were ever used in the construction of it, layer on layer. And you can see that this is the internal. The other thing that this is, and I don't think I've got a shot of it, but this was the biggest storage tank in Sydney for fossil fuel. And we wanted to tell the story that the, this could be the new turning point. So this is now turned into a wind turbine farm. The wind turbines are stuck up here. So it was the idea about that transition of thinking about the whole site so that now what was once a fossil fuel was trying to in challenge that concept was renewable energy. And just some of the simple elegance but beautiful uh, composition. And again, this is a design idea that came about. That bun wall that runs around was to protect the oil if it spilt.
from going into the harbour. So all we did was simply cut a slice through there, lay it down and it became the path and the access point for it. Again, the recycle, reuse drove the design philosophy. And just, I think at the end of the day, we still need to do beautiful design. It's just not about an idea, it's about detail. And I talked about that. We must keep that thinking going right down to the nth degree. Oh, just last thing on this one. That's my 21st birthday mug that I got from my, my darling parents. I encouraged everybody who worked on the site to bring something along and put it in the wall. Everybody who worked on it, the builders, the surveyors, anybody, there's stuff there that they can walk around and look at and say, oh, that's me. You know? And I think that connection back to the site can be quite important. What time have we got? I'm going to quickly, I'm going to quickly go through the last couple, yeah? This is a project we did in uh, Berlin, Tempelhof Airport. I don't know if anybody's heard of Tempelhof Airport, but it's uh, been closed down now. It was the uh, first airport that was in, in, envisaged as an international point of connecting to the wider world. Anyway, this had run down. The idea was they needed to um, they needed to find another use for it, but they had very little money. Berlin is a, was a very poor uh, council. Um, they didn't have anything in particular that they could offer in terms of um, budget. And they wanted ideas in how they might redevelop this site as a park without spending any money. So the idea, the, the outer ring here of that building was the terminus. And we tried to take the idea of that outer ring and form a, a loop. So the idea, if you think about Hitler and that whole idea, it was really kind of counter um, embracive of the, the wider world. It was more about dictating and overtaking. So this circle represented a kind of like a rethinking of how the communities could come back together again. And so the idea here was that this would be a million um, poplar trees that would be purchased from around the world for those who want to commemorate those who had been lost in the war and that that ring would celebrate that unification back to an understanding about how things you know, possibly could have been better. And so we didn't have to pay anything for the building. We left the runways, which you can see as strips in the landscape, and simply just added a few paths in there. So I achieved, we were the only uh, non-European organisation to get shortlisted for that, but ultimately it didn't, it didn't go forward. And just some of the simple images of just leaving the grass to grow wild, the trees on the outside, spatial creation, the movement through that uh, ring of trees, and then the internal uh, opportunities that it created. And then the use of the runways and how they might be worked. And then the reinterpretation of the terminus as, a, as an event space. Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? This is not successful. This is Hurricane uh, Katrina in New York. Uh, this is a project that we uh, went in to understand how they might rebuild the edges around New York after Hurricane Katrina. The, the, the destruction that occurred was quite incredible. Surprisingly, one of the most sophisticated perceived cities in the world, natural forces come in and destroy it. Why? Because they didn't understand the systems. They thought they could build against it, that they weren't part of nature, but unfortunately, they are part of nature. And when nature wants to take control, this is what happens. So they needed to rebuild. And our concept really was to reinstate the natural forces that protected all coastlines, the sand dunes, the barriers that protect all our inland systems, and then to develop behind that sand dune as a protective barrier and create a parkland that was um, uh, supporting the community that would be then built further back from the, from the land there. We were shortlisted for this project and again it did not uh, proceed. The idea of how that would function during a, a high storm event. I'm nearly there. Uh, we did the Parramatta Road, but we also recently been asked to do a, a study on Parramatta um, itself. Parramatta is the second major city in um, Australia, and um, it's been totally degraded. Sydney dominates everything about Sydney, or about New South Wales, about cities in, in, in the New South Wales area. 
and uh, they needed to understand how they could refocus and re-energize that as a city that had been dearly unloved for a number of years. And so the idea, if I go back just quickly, was the connection from Circular Quay, which is where the Harbour Bridge is, and linking it back up to the, um, the Parramatta itself. And this is where a lot of the Sydney siders now live. And so the forces at work that I talked about with the Far Rock competition in New York, the same here. Flooding had continually wiped out the communities either side of the river. As rivers tend to do, they flood. So their idea was that they would turn their back to the river and they would then focus on in occupying the space. But the beauty of the river was the foundation for the whole of this, this town. The reason why Paramount River, or Paramount was there was because of the river. Yet now we turn our back on it. And we do that quite often in our cities. We turn our back on that very thing that made us vital. And so the idea was very much around re-engaging back to the river. But re-engaging back with an ecological conscience, re-engaging back with a sense of how we might manage and work with the systems, the forces at work. The Dutch do it very well. They have floodgates. They have systems where you can evacuate at certain layers at certain levels. And so it employs that strategy, but it also tries to say, let's re-face, re-turn ourselves around to engage with the, with the river. Um, and just some of the images that, that we were trying to communicate. This is in the process of, of moving forward, um, but we'll see ultimately how it evolves and how it um, <coughs> develops. Because of course the developers have got to come in now. Just a quick, I think I've got two more. This is um, a one that I'm, actually Mike has, has led this one in the Sydney office. And you always want to work in those major components of the city in which we live. I want to work in cities. The reason why we're here now is we want to work and do the best work we can. It doesn't matter where we are. We should be doing great work collectively. You know, and you were very generous in suggesting that, you know, we all want to get better as, as professionals, as designers, and learn from one another. And that's what it's really all about. I'm not here to, you know, to just do my thing. I want to grow. I, I never want to be just doing what I'm doing. I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to understand what others are doing and get better and better and better until I cark it and then somebody else will take up and do better and better and better and that's what we're all on about and learning. So this one is a, um, a beautiful uh, little project in the, a component of one of the second most important historic areas of Sydney. You can see again the Harbour Bridge, the Opera House. It's this zone that's kind of to the to the eastern side of the, the major component of the city. And it contains some incredible things. It contains our major library, the Mint, all heritage buildings. It contains the Parliament House, or our State Parliament House. It contains our, one of the biggest new projects we're ever undertaking since the Opera House, which is the new um, Sydney Art Gallery, which is located over here. And it's connected to the Botanic Gardens. And so, we actually have been very blessed in that we're involved in all these various little components. We're working with Sana Architects on the new art gallery. We've recently completed works in the Botanic Gardens, which I'll show you. And we're also negotiating with New South Wales Government on some of the other works associated with all the other components. And links and connections and how do you weld this, this, this area that had been so dis disjointed and just built randomly. How do you connect it? And, and turned it into something truly special. Just some of the works that we've been doing. New interventions, new buildings. One thing I've got to say, and I know that um, when I worked here in, in, in England, there was a, a reticence about landscape architects getting their elbows out and saying, we should be operating here. We should be operating at the urban design. We should be setting up the framework for the architects for them to come in and then do design, rather than the architect saying, oh, here, I've got a little bit of green space for you to operate in, you know. <laughs> Can tell me exactly what, what sort of tree do you think would be good here? Oh, that's a good question. I'm, I'll go away and think about it. We should be driving the spaces. We should be driving the thinking. And this is what we've been blessed to do in this. Well, a lot of our work, we lead. I have architects working for us all the time. Our office, we have probably more architects than we have landscape architects. But why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we be leading? Because we are the ones who understand the total composition. And I think that's something we should be doing. This building, even this form, is developed by 
us to suggest how we're going to work, how we're going to make connections, how we're going to drive things. We led the design on the built form on this, which is in the Botanic Gardens, which is recently been completed. And we're working not so easily with Sun Architects. I don't think they see the same idea that landscape architects should be leading, but then they're God. Um, and just some of the works and drawings that we're working with on them. Uh, just two more and I'll be done. Uh, we also work in China. This is a, a really interesting project. We recently won in design competition for a bird airport. Great story, right? Love this. This would see those buildings over there. That was the next stage of development. But unfortunately, the developer ran out of money for two years. And in the meantime, after they scraped all the ground out and forgot, you know, just couldn't get forward, any further on it, the rains came, the monsoons came, and water came. And birds, migratory birds from all across Asia flying onto Australia, started nesting here. And so the World Life, Wildlife Fund said, whoa, hang on, we're spotting. You can't do it. This is now precious land. It's gorgeous, isn't it? You know? So the poor guys were supposed to develop this and now are faced with the challenge that they've now got to build a sanctuary for the birds. And uh, they put that out of competition and we're lucky to win. And this is a really beautiful thing. The fact is the birds come from Asia and actually end up in Australia. So here we are going back looking after them. And just some of the images that we put forward in that design competition. I think part of our role also is to project very strong, I think architects are particularly strong in imagery, and to convince and to give reassurance that we know what we're doing, I think it's something we need to focus on as well. A lot of these images are in the house and we work very hard on it. I'm just going to finish off this last one. It's a kind of a looping, finishing talking point because I showed you Rionjin and I showed you about less is more. A lot of this is us going in and being, you look at me and rah, rah, rah. But actually, I'm perhaps quite proud of this one because it was just a simple little site that was broken and battered and it just needed a little bit of love. I don't know if anybody's heard about the Mona Art um, Gallery in Tasmania. It's revitalised Tasmania, it doesn't matter. Um, but this is an extension to that that sits just around the bait. So the Mona, the gallery's over here, this is our little site over here. It was just a concrete pad and it was a place where people would arrive on a ferry and then walk their way around to the art gallery. Part of the original simple design composition. And this is the end product. It's just pure, simple use of concrete, very minimal budget, the introduction of a bit of glass. You can see the concrete just broken up and very simply planted. The use of walls and just subtle, simple planting. Concrete, concrete, nothing more. And then just the use of plant material and the celebration of that flowering period of the plant material. That's the communities, local communities coming together. Celebrational space but the creation of space. And now I'm here talking to you. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thanks very much.